Well, I'm sure we still live in Portadown and married to Drew. We have two boys. Caden is 11. He's with me today. And I was saying first service, Eli, who's eight, is away with his daddy watching Manchester United probably lose today. <laughs> Let's, don't boo me. I'm not there. I'm here. <laughs> boo them. Uh, so that's where they are. We are from Portadown originally, although I now work for a church in Belfast called CFC. So that's where Craig is today. So we've done a bit of a swap. He's up there. I'm down here, which is very handy this morning, only taking five minutes to drive to church. That was wonderful. So it's really, really good to be with you. Uh, so I have a house full of boys. I am the sole single female in a house of manliness, and I am dragged to every superhero movie. I have watched Power Rangers and Ben 10 and every form of male entertainment. I have seen it all. And one of the more recent ones that came on TV, I don't know if you saw it about a year ago, was this show called Lego Masters. Did anybody, was I the only one subjected to Lego Masters? Is this program on Channel 4 about competitive Lego building? This is a thing, guys. People build Lego, like I'm not talking about kids, there were grown men on this show building competitive Lego and having a jolly good time, I can tell you. So they built this Lego and some of the things they could build was like absolutely incredible. Like it was, I, I did actually get, don't tell them, but I did actually get quite into it towards the end of the, the, end of the series. And they would build these incredible structures, but the whole thing took place in this studio that had Lego just lining the walls. And all of it was like color coded and sized. So there's like one box for, bless you, one box for yellow bricks that were, you know, two sizes and yellow bricks that were four sizes and then the ones with the eyes. And there was literally, like, it was unreal. A child's dream and these also, these grown men who needed therapy, their dream too. And it was just, it was so beautiful. So we watched this show and at the end of it, my boy says to me, mom, we are going to do this with our Lego. We are going to color code our Lego. Now guys, I need to explain to you, we had been donated Lego from a friend of mine whose children had outgrown the Lego and whose husband did not play like, like, with Lego like the men on the show. Eight boxes guys, eight boxes this size be this and they decided they were going to color code all this Lego. Well, any parent whose child says they're going to tidy up without you asking them, of course you're like, yes, may the Lord bless you and keep you as you you know, do the task. But I said, I'll help, I'll help, I'll help. So I got down the floor, we're color coding all this Lego. 10 minutes, 10 minutes they lasted before they left the room and left this mug color coding the Lego for days, like literally days over the Christmas holiday. I'm color, because once you start a task, you gotta finish it, you know what I mean? I color coded all of this Lego and all these boxes. And then this weird thing happened where my boys who hadn't built Lego in like months, despite having eight box loads of it, started to build again. And they built so much Lego over this Christmas break. And as I watched them, I just realized, you know, it's really, really difficult to build in mess. It's much easier to build when everything's color coded and tidy, isn't it? But life is not color coded and life is not tidy. And life doesn't fit inside the nice neat boxes that we'd really like it to. And sometimes life's a mess. And people are messy and families are messy and community and, Life is just messy. And I just wonder sometimes how, how you build in the middle of life when it's just a mess. How do you keep building for the kingdom? How do you keep caring about those things that are eternal? How do you keep building a good life? How do you not just give up and sit down and say, well, stuff it. Like the world's a mess. What, what good can we do? How, do? how do we keep building in the middle of a world that's extremely messy? And then I'm reminded of who I follow because I follow a God who is an absolute expert at building in mess. In fact, it seems to attract him. Like it seems that God looks at mess and sees not the mess, but what he can build out of it. Like it seems to, because he's a God of restoration. He doesn't walk out of mess. He walks into it and builds right in the middle of it. And it reminded me of a, a passage in scripture, which somebody told me after this service, your earlier service was read last week too. So I'm going to read it to you again. I'm not going to preach the same preach David Legg did. I'm not even going to attempt it. Dude can preach. I just do my best with Isaiah 61. But this is what it says. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, to release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn 
to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow beauty, a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will, listen to this, rebuild the ancient ruins, restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. You know part of why I love that? It, this passage is not talking about walking into a mess that just happened yesterday or you know, a mess that happened this morning. This is talking about places in your life that have been long devastated. This is about historic mess. This is about areas of your family or your community that have been a mess for generations. And you're so tempted, I am so tempted whenever something's been a mess for a really long time to just give up hope. Like it's always been like this. How can Craig Avon or Portadown or Lurgan look any different if it's always been like this? How can my family look any different if it's always been like this? How can this nation look any different? How can my workplace look any different? How can it look any different? It's been like this forever. Nothing's going to change now. And then I read that he walks into places that are long devastated. And he rebuilds in amongst the ruins. You see, we have to remember who we follow. We follow a God who walks into the middle of long devastated places and builds something absolutely spectacular right there in the middle of the mess. And I want to encourage you this morning that this is who you like. This is who you follow. This is who you claim to follow. This God, this God who rebuilds in the middle of mess. And so, really, what I I I am left asking is how then? How do I do it? God, if you're asking, like this passage seems to suggest, for a remnant to rebuild with, because this is the way that God functions all through scripture. God walks into the ruins. He finds a remnant, which is a few remaining people. He asks them to partner with him, and he rebuilds with them in the middle of the mess. This is the story of scripture over and over and over again, and the story of scripture in our generation. God is looking for a remnant, a few people who will not give up hope, who will not sit down in the middle of the mess, who will partner with him to see a community rebuilt or a family rebuilt or a generational story rebuilt. So how do I do that? If I'm sitting here this morning thinking, okay, God, I want to I wanna do, I want to be part of that. If you're going to rebuild Craig Avon, then I want to be part of that. If you're going to rebuild my street, I want to be part of that. You're going to rebuild my, my family, I want to be part of that, but how? It was really hard to build in the middle of the mess. How did I do it? And I think what's really helpful is the fact that there are some clues here hidden in Isaiah. Because, you see, the Bible is not a series of single stories. I'm really passionate about this. I think sometimes because we don't, we never sit down, unless you're super holy, we never sit down and read the whole Bible at once. Has anybody ever sat down and read the whole Bible at once? I would have been so impressed with you right now if you had, but it probably would have been a lie if you had said yes, let's be honest. Nobody reads it as one story because it's so big. So I think sometimes we forget it's all one story because we've just been reading a little bit from here and a little bit from there. And when you read the Bible like that, you miss layers and layers of beauty and treasure and significance because the whole thing's connected and it's supposed to be read in a connected way. And if we want to get the most out of scripture, the best way for us to read it is to look for the links. There are links in places and people and language. And whenever you find the links, you bring the two passages together and you read them side by side instead of independently. And sometimes what will happen, you will read something in the Old Testament and you'll realize that's also in the New Testament. Like for example, Isaiah 61, which we read today, you will find that again in the New Testament because Jesus is going to quote from Isaiah. And if you put those two stories side by side, you're going to find lots of new things. And so what we find is, as Isaiah rolls on, because see all of these chapters we find in our Bible, they're not in the original. Like chapter 61, it didn't say that in the original. It's just put there so that you and me can find it, so we all know we're on the same page. So it's supposed to be read like one big story. The whole of Isaiah would have been in one big scroll. And so as you move through Isaiah 61 and on into Isaiah 62, you're going to find some language that's super helpful. 
to draw us into a different passage and a different part of scripture is going to teach us how to do this, how do we rebuild in ruins. Because you're going to see language like this. In Isaiah 61, verse 8, it says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people. Now listen to this line and see if, use your brain. If you've been in the Bible a long time, think about where you've heard this before. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. That's important language and really specifically chosen language. As the passage rolls on into Isaiah 62, we're going to meet this language, which ties it all together for us. In Isaiah 62, verse 8, the Lord has sworn by his right hand and by his mighty arm, never again will your grain as be as food for your enemies, and never again will your foreigners drink the new wine. And so what we see is we see these combination of phrases, this everlasting covenant, and then this double use of the phrase never again. Never again, never again. And you see, when you tie that together, that's going to bring you all the way back to Genesis. And you're going to find those exact words written way back with a man called Noah. Remember him? Noah on his big boat. Genesis, in Genesis 9, verse 11 to 16, let me read you a little bit of it. It says this, I establish my covenant with you. This is what God said to Noah. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of the flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. The Bible's really specific about language, this double use of never again. And then on down, Genesis 9, 16, whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all the living creatures of the earth. It's this language that's supposed to make us go, oh, this is connected. This, and so if we pull Genesis 9 and Isaiah 61 together and we set them side by side, what we're going to find is Isaiah 61 talks about rebuilding in the ruins and Genesis 9 talks about a man who had to do just that because Noah had to rebuild in devastation. There was not a, a time in history where the world looked like it was more in a mess than Noah's day. And I know you and I, looking at our world right now, we think this is so dark. The world has got so dark. It's got so dark. It's got so dark. And I hear you. I'm not saying the world's not dark. I'm just saying it's not darker than it was in Noah's day. Because let me tell you what the Bible tells me about Noah's day. In Genesis chapter 6, there's this really, it's this terrifying verse. Genesis 6, verse 5, this is Noah's day. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every, every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Bible doesn't exaggerate. God doesn't do exaggeration. He does facts. And the Bible tells me that in Noah's day, every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time can you imagine living in a world like that where people were incapable of manners grace kindness self-sacrifice goodness that it just didn't exist every man for himself everybody evil all the time this is horrific and this is the state of the world that Noah is in and you see if I was God which you're very glad I'm not you know what I would do I would say, you know, I made a planet before. I can make one again. I'm just going to start with a whole new planet. And a whole new, I'm just going to develop a whole new people group over here. Forget these humans. Look what they've done. Forget them. But you know what? God is deeply connected to the human story. And he will not leave that which he creates. He is incapable of leaving that which he creates. And so instead of walking out of the human story, and starting again on a different planet, he steps back into the middle of this mess because God knows I can still rebuild even in this middle of this mess. I just need a remnant. And Noah, this righteous man, becomes a remnant with whom he partners with to rebuild. Isn't God just super kind? Like, I don't know if you've ever felt like you've made an absolute mess of your life and God should just leave you forever. I felt like that at times in my life. But he just doesn't. He's just so faithful. He's just so good. And he always steps into the middle of the mess and he rebuilds. And so we meet this man called Noah. And the life of Noah, and um, watching what God is doing in the life of Noah, becomes a real masterclass in rebuilding in the ruins. And it provides for you and I some really helpful tips. I don't know your life. But I know if you're not in a mess, you've been in one or you will be in one because that's just the human story. 
And so this is so helpful for me personally to watch him and to watch what God's doing in the middle and to take some tips away. So how do we rebuild in the middle of the mess? I'm going to give you some practical tips. Is that okay? I'm, I'm just going to take that silence as a yes and do what I want, to be honest, because that's what's in my notes. So that's what you're getting, whether you want it or not. I don't really know why I asked your permission. It was a rhetorical question. This is what we're speaking about. So uh, here are some principles to keep you building in the mess. The first one is this. Please don't miss the provision in the middle of the mess. It's very, very easy to become over dramatic in the middle of your mess and just say it's all awful. The whole thing is awful. There is no good in this anywhere, is there not? You see, I serve a God who, even in the middle of my messy seasons, he's been there before me, tucking up all the provision I need to make it through. This is how God functions. This is the story of the Bible. That God is always up ahead, making sure that I make it through any season by tucking up provision in the worst and the darkest of days. There's always a seed of hope and there's always light. And be really, really careful whenever you're in the middle of a messy season to not to miss the provision. You see, the provision was going to come in a really strange way, and often it does with God. He's so unexpected. And in Noah's day, the provision comes in the form of a flood. And we've heard this story so many times, I think, that we miss how traumatic this was. Because we've been listening to it, if we've been in church, we've been listening to it from more tiny. I don't know that Noah would have felt like the flood felt like provision in that day. Because even though Noah and his family make it through this flood, everybody else they know does not. And that's hugely traumatic. Hugely traumatic. And it must have been extremely hard in the middle of that to have understood the goodness of God. How can you be good in the middle of this? This doesn't look good. How can this be the goodness of God? And yet God is good. He doesn't do good things. He is good. So he cannot not be good. It's just who he is. It's how he always functions. The problem is sometimes it's just really hard to see the goodness of God. But this flood became the goodness of God. This flood was provision for them. They just maybe couldn't see it at the time. First of all, it was provision that took them out of something. Imagine if it hadn't happened. And imagine what the world would have looked like if everybody all of the time thought evil things. Imagine raising your kids in that environment where you just anticipated people would be bad to them because that's the way it was always going to be. Imagine you trying to do life in that kind of environment. Imagine generations later still being in that environment. It would have been absolutely horrific. God's, God's provision of a flood, though it looks, it doesn't look good was kindness, because he was taking them out of that. And what I've learned following God all of these years is this. There are some times in my life I don't understand what God's doing. And it's really hard for me to find his hand and his goodness. And I think, I know you're good, but it's really hard for me to see that right now. But I have learned that hindsight is a really, really good thing. Because when I look back in seasons of my life that were really difficult, you know what I've, I've learned more often than not? Often a difficult reality is a rescue from a devastating alternative. Often a difficult reality has been a rescue from a devastating alternative, but because I've been rescued from the devastating alternative and I never saw it, I didn't even realize how good God was being. God has protected you from things and you have no clue. You don't realize how good he's been because he shielded you from things that were coming your way and they never got to you because of the protective hand of God. And sometimes the difficult road he asked you to walk down was so that you would avoid a devastating one. And, and I don't think we just see it here in Noah's story. I think we see it all through scripture. I think we see it later on. You remember later on the earth becomes repopulated and God's people end up in slavery in Egypt. And then there's this massive rescue takes place, which is just brilliant and they're all released after over 400 years of slavery uh, and subjugation and abuse all of these people are released and then and then the story there's this huge curveball and you're like honestly what on earth could you possibly be doing God in the middle of this because God releases all of these slaves from Egypt and then brings them to a sea in front of them there's a sea in front of them and there's the enemy behind them and God led them there to that, to that, so they could die in front of a sea, it, didn't, it doesn't look good. 
in that moment, there's no way those people are thinking, oh, this is the goodness of God. Don't worry, guys. This is the goodness of God. It looked like God didn't know what he was doing. That's exactly what it looked like. And I love the fact that scripture puts in for us these little nuggets so that we get to see into the thought processes of God that weren't obvious at the time. Because in Exodus, it says this about that very moment. In Exodus 13, verse 17, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road, which let's be honest, would have been better, surely, did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. They didn't know that. When they stood in front of that sea, they didn't understand that God had taken them that way so that they would avoid the Philistine country, because if they'd walked in there, one of two things would have happened. They either would have been completely slaughtered because they weren't ready to fight, or they would have given up and gone back to slavery. And their story, and their children's story, and their grandchildren's story would have been completely different. God took them down a really difficult road. That wasn't easy. Facing that sea was not easy. But you know what it was? It was a better, it was better than the, the devastating alternative. And I I don't know if you're in a season of your life where you can't see the goodness of God, but sometimes the goodness of God is unseen because we don't realize what he's protected us from. And it's only, I think, someday when we see him face to face, we'll understand how incredibly good he has been to us all of these years. And we didn't even know. And we didn't even know. It was provision that took them out of something. Do you know what? That flood was also provision that took them into something. It took them into this beautiful moment of destiny where they got to reshape the earth and reclaim the earth the way that God intended it should be. They had an opportunity to shift things in their environment that was remarkable. There's this, you know the way you hear about no one is ark? That word ark is the Hebrew word to ba. And there's another place where we find it that fascinates me. When God uses the same word in two places by his Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit inspired these scriptures, it's really important to look to look at why. And that little word, ark, is used in Moses' story as well, when we've been thinking about him leading these people out of slavery, whenever he was just a baby, in fact. And Moses is this baby, and he's growing up in a really difficult environment. Uh, there's a power on the throne who wants to eradicate his people. They're getting too big, scaring them. And so in order to eradicate the people, they decide, let's kill the baby boys. These are facts. Sometimes we've read these stories so many times, we forget these are real people. And as a mother of boys, like I just, I can't even imagine. So there's one wee feisty mum. <laughs> and she's like, you are not getting my kid, mate. I don't care who you are or what you're the boss of. You're not getting my boy. And she comes up with this plan to protect Moses, who's this baby boy at the time and should be, uh, should be annihilated. And the way they're killing these baby boys is they're drowning them in the Nile. Isn't that horrific? I want to drown these boys in the Nile. So this wee mummy. I say sometimes a wee mummy, just being a mummy, is shaping history and she doesn't even know it. Uh, this wee mummy is about to shape history because she's like, you're not having my kiddo. And she builds an ark. That's the same word, to ba. She builds this little basket, and it's, it's called an ark, same word, and she puts Moses in it. And then she does something really weird. She puts this basket on the Nile, the very place where they're drowning the kiddos. And she decides she's going to put this basket on that very same water. And then you, there's this poetic poignancy where the water that was meant to drown Moses instead becomes a vehicle that carries him into destiny. Because this little baby in this little ark bobs along the water right into the hands of a princess who's going to rescue him and grow him up in the palace. It's just, isn't it, isn't it so clever? Isn't God just so clever? The waters that were supposed to take him under, they carry him into destiny. And this is what happened. This is a story. This is just, this, this is your story. Because no weapon formed against you will prosper. None of them. Zip, nada, none. None of them. Because God is able to take the things that the enemy tries to annihilate you and I with, tries to cause and create all this chaos and the mess. God is clever enough to take that and to make it work for us, not against us, just like the water of, this, of the Nile bobbing this little boy into his destiny. Because God's just really clever. And sometimes what looks like absolute mess, hidden in the middle of it is provision that's taken us out of something 
And sometimes it's just what we need to carry us into where God has for us next because God's really good like that. So when you're in the middle of your mess, I want you to pause for a minute and remind yourself of what you know. You know you serve a God who will not leave you, who will not forsake you, and has promised to provide for you everything that you need. He is your good shepherd who brings you to pastures, even in the middle. It says in Psalm 23, verse 5, even in the presence of my enemies, what does he do? He prepares a table in the middle of war. So right in the middle of your war zone, God's still setting the table. And and the trick is to sit down at the table long enough to eat from what he's given us because we're so busy running around trying to stop the war that we forget that right there in the middle, God's still providing for us. So don't miss the provision in the mess. Tip one. Tip two, don't miss the purpose in the mess. Sometimes in the middle of our mess, there's like, I just, there cannot be a purpose to this. It's just too dark and difficult. There can't, God cannot be doing anything good in this. There cannot be purpose to this. And I am sure Noah must have felt like that. So I did some biblical maths the other, the other week, the other month around this. So I, I, maybe I'm an idiot, but I thought that Noah and his family were on the boat for 40 days and 40 nights. Did anybody else think that? Just me. I'm the only idiot in Portadown. 40 days and 40 nights. That's what I thought. Turns out that is not what happened. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but when I actually read the Bible, which is always a good idea, guys, read the Bible. When I actually read the Bible and did the maths, I realized that while it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, the water covered the earth, and it tells us in Genesis, for 150 days, and then there's this long process by which the water goes down. And when you, when you add up all the sums, they were on that boat for a year and 10 days. A year and 10 days on a boat with your family. Now, maybe your family is a delight to be around. I love my family. Like, I love them. But a year and 10 days stuck in a boat with them? Are you kidding me? That could not felt purposeful at all. Uh, And here's the question, right, that I'm left asking. You see, God could have done anything. God had the job done in a day. So why did he let them float around for a year and 10 days before he took them off the boat? Because, you see, everything's scheduled. So that was really intentional. It's not like God forgot they were on the boat and then a year and 10 days later, you know. It's like, it, that's intentional. Why did he leave them floating around for a year and 10 days? This must have felt utterly purposeless to everyone on the ship, including the mother, I can tell you. A year and 10 days. So I started to ask myself, well, God, what could you have been doing? A year and 10 days in this boat, what could you possibly have been doing? And here's some things I've come up with. You know what I think one of the purposes was? I think God was just giving them a break. Genuinely, they'd been building this big boat for ages. That's a lot of physical manual labor. And now there is no physical manual labor apart from looking after the animals, which I imagine was still a big enough job. But I just just feel like it was God resting them, like giving them a break. God really loves rest. That's why he gave us Sabbath, the seventh day, to do that. So we should probably rest some more. If we don't rest, we're probably missing some of the goodness of God. I think part of it was just a break. Let's just take a break from this building. Because you see, when they get off the boat, they're going to have a lot more building to do again, aren't they? They're going to have to build again. But for now, let's just rest. I think part of it was rest. I think part of it was strengthening their community. You see, when they get off the boat, God is going to give them a task to do. And they're not going to be able to do it as individuals. They're going to have to do it as a collective, as a group, as a unit. And see, if you have an independent spirit, I am an independent person. I like to just get the things done by myself. And I'm realizing that that's not biblical. That God, God doesn't so much choose individuals as he does families and units and groups of people. And we need to learn how to work together. And working together is not easy. It is just easier to do the thing on your own. But it's not God's way. And actually, it's not possible for any one of us to get into the fullness of our destiny without the people around us. Community is essential. And working together and staying together is essential. And so I think God is strengthening this little community, giving them a year and 10 minutes to four, or a year and 10 minutes, a year, a year and 10 days, days, thanks. Thanks to the guy in the fourth row for that, days, ten, a year and 10 days. He's given them that time to build these these bonds that can't be broken, he's strengthening this unit. And then I think he's also reshaping culture. This family have been living surrounded by people who who think in an evil way, 
which is really just thinking in the opposite way to God. And if that culture is on the inside of them and they carry that onto a new earth, they're just going to pollute everything all over again. And God has to do some work on the inside of them to take that out of them and to reshape them so that they are prepared to do well in their next season. And so he, he silences all of the voices and the only voice they're left with as their guide is Noah, who is known as the righteous man on earth. And he becomes the guiding point for these, this family. And God begins to reshape their attitudes and their ideas and their concepts and their theory of life. Because if they carry what was in the last season into the next season, they're going to pollute it. Can I tell you, you see the stuff that was in your last season that wasn't from God? If you carry that into your next season, you are going to pollute the new thing that God's doing in your life. And I've seen this happen with people and relationships. Because maybe they were in a relationship that ended really badly, whether that was a friendship or somebody they were dating or a family member or whatever. And they were in a relationship where they were betrayed. And instead of taking time to deal with the betrayal and get over it, they carry the betrayal into their next season and their new relationship and they just sabotage it because they see the new person through the old lens. And we need to take time to make sure that God's being given space to do what he needs to do on the inside of us. Otherwise, when he gives us something good and new, we're just going to ruin it with the pollution from the last season. And so I think that it, there was purpose in this because God's giving them a season to reset. It's like a reset for them internally before there's reset on earth. It was a season of provision. It was a season of purpose. And it was really important they didn't miss those things. Before I sit down, I just want to say one more thing, and it's this. You see, if you are faced with the worst kind of mess, especially if it's historic and it's been going on a long time, don't miss a provision, sure. Don't miss a purpose, sure. But you know the most important thing that you need to not miss in this season? Don't miss his power. Don't forget about who it is you are serving. Sometimes the storm around us is so loud that we forget that we serve the one who walks on water and causes storms to cease. We forget that he is more powerful than the thing that we are caught up in, even if we've been caught up in it for generations in our family line. Don't miss his power. We see it in this story because, you see, at the very beginning, when humanity is made, they're given a job to do. This is what God says he's going to achieve through the human story. We find it in Genesis. I really, really love the first three chapters of Genesis. Genesis 1, verse 28, this is what God says. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. This is what God is promising to do through humanity. I am going to cover the earth with you. I am going to fill the earth with you. This is what I am going to do. It's God's command backed with God's power. But I want you to carry that into Noah's story. Does it not feel like a huge setback? The flood is a huge setback because they're supposed to be filling the earth. And now they've lost the majority of the population. How are they going to fill the earth now? How is God ever going to make good on what he said was going to happen when they would fill the earth and subdue it? And yet watch what God does. They get off this ark and there's only a few of them. Just, a, just Noah and his family. And yet God says this to them as soon as they get off in Genesis 9. Then God blessed Noah and his sons, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And it's God saying, I am still going to do what I said I was going to do. And I know it doesn't look like it right now, but I said this was going to happen. And this is still my plan. I have not changed my mind, even though we've had a setback here. This is still the mandate on human life. And I love what God does. There's this cheeky little verse just on down. Because Genesis is written before the earth is filled. Like now we look at the population of humanity all around the world. Like we really are filling the earth, aren't we? We've been scattered everywhere. But this is written, this, this book is written long before that happened. And yet, in Genesis 9, verse 19, it says this. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. God said that before it happened. It's a bit cheeky, isn't it? Do you know why God said that before it happened? Because God is confident in his own divine ability, and he knows that if he starts something, he has the ability to finish it. He has complete faith in his own ability to pull the thing off because he said he would and because he's God. And you and I need to remember in the middle of our mess that if God said it, God can do it. 
And God doesn't promise us something that he can't keep. And he doesn't start something he can't finish. And that's why he says, that. that's why the Bible tells us that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Because God doesn't start stuff and not finish it. He always finishes what he starts. And maybe God started something in your family and in your life. And right now it looks like a massive setback. And you're looking at the promises that God made you. And you're thinking, I can't see how I can get to that from here. But you need to remember who you're dealing with. You're dealing with God Almighty here who spoke the world into existence. I think he can finish what he started in your life. Do you not think that the God who spoke right into that moment in time where there's this one little family and says, I'm going to fill the whole earth with humanity and did it. Do you not think that he can do what he promised you? Of course he can. And there have been so many times in my life where I have sat in my mess with the promises of God in my hands because God makes promises and I've had his good promises in my hands, but I've had circumstances around me that have said the complete opposite to the promise. And I have had to remind myself that he who began a good work in me will be faithful to complete it no matter what the storm says. And so when I'm this little baby, Baby with meningitis on death's door. The God who began a good work in me was faithful to complete it and I made it right through that sickness and out the other side because God was not finished with me. And when I was in my teenage years and my family fell apart and it could have absolutely derailed me, God stepped into the mess of our family and began to rebuild amongst the ruins because he had made a promise. And God always finishes what he starts. And when I was in my early 20s, and I went through this season of immense anxiety where I could barely leave my house. And I had these promises from God. And yet I was stuck in my living room. It's like, how can, I, how can I do that when I'm stuck here? But here I am today, out of my living room and not one bit afraid. Because he who began a good work in me was faithful to complete it. And he had made a promise. And even when the circumstances said I couldn't, he said I could. And his word is the final word. So I am here to remind you today that as God has begun a good work in your family, he will be faithful to complete it. And you need to hold on to his power in the middle of your circumstance. And you need to remember, regardless of the mess, you need to remember who it is you're following. And he is a God much bigger than any mess you or I or anyone else has gotten us into. And he who began a good work in us, he will be faithful to complete it because God always finishes what he starts. This is who he is. Can I pray for you?